Dr. Serrano is going to get us started for today. Good morning, guys. Uh, I know all the residents, obviously, for the applicants. My name's Philippe. I'm one of the attendees over at the other side at Montessori. Uh, and I'm going to try to talk to you guys about DK and HA tech. I'm going to try to make it as simple as possible. Uh, but kind of the first point and the most important point I want to make to you guys is which specialty sees DKA in the first three hours? Us, right? Who sees DKA or HA test in the first three hours? Us. So it drives me a little crazy whenever we call endocrine or critical help us manage DKA or HA tests, right? So these are our diseases, right? This is our stuff. Um, so this is this is our stuff, right? So we should be expert experts. Critical care should not be experts for the first hours of DKA. Endocrine should not be experts in the first hours of DKA. We should be the experts, right? So we should take ownership. Uh, we should be the ones who know how to manage this in an expert fashion at the beginning when the patient presents, okay? So let's talk about DKA. Okay. So, in order to be experts in DKA, even though this is really boring, I think we need to understand why DKA happens. Okay. So, you guys remember this from medical school. This is a very boring, annoying graph, but the point of it is that insulin is an anabolic hormone. Okay. And, and if you guys remember from anabolic steroids, what anabolic hormones do is they cause growth. Okay. So, when you have insulin in your system, it's in times of plenty. Right. There's a lot of sugar in your system. And so what the body wants to do is it wants to store that sugar, it wants to turn it into stuff like muscle and fat that you can store, and at the same time, insulin blocks breakdown of that stuff, all right? So this, the, the things that I want to concentrate on today uh, are this, okay? So insulin causes glucose to be taken up into your tissues. It causes glycolysis, which is just uh, basically the normal pathway of metabolism of glucose, where you turn it into pyruvate. Uh, it, it stops the breakdown of fat, stops the creation of ketones, and it stops to break down of proteins, okay? So in normal patients, like you or me, when we have insulin, this is what happens, okay? So kind of a little crappy diagram that I made. Your pancreas makes insulin, and insulin goes to its receptors, and it brought blocks break down of fatty acids into free fatty acids, and it also blocks production of ketone bodies in the liver. Okay. So this is you and me, right? This is a healthy patient. And the type 1 diabetic, which is the patients that we classically think about having DKA, they don't make any insulin, right? So there's no inhibition of this process. So they just create ketone bodies, right, when there's no insulin. Okay? So this is the patients that we think about that have DKA, the typical type 1 diabetic patients. Okay? Now type 2 diabetes, a little bit tricky, right? So these patients still make insulin, right? Their pancreas still works. Uh, the disease process in type 2 diabetes is what we call insulin resistance, right, which I kind of showed here by the decreased number of receptors. But you still have insulin there. You still have inhibition of this process. So classically, this is why we think that type 2 diabetics don't get DKA, right? So when you're taught in medical school, DKA is type 1 diabetics. Type 2 diabetics don't get DKA. However, over the past maybe 10, 15 years, we've started to recognize that DKA can actually happen in type 2 diabetics. And all you guys know this already, right? Um, but why, why is that? If type 2 diabetics still have insulin in their system, why are they getting DKA? So this is what really happens in DKA in patients towards the end sort of other of their disease process, right? So now they have severe insulin resistance, right? So the number of receptors has decreased markedly. Number two, for some reason, these patients also stop making insulin, right? So uh, the mechanism hasn't really been worked out, but over time, this insulin resistance in type 2 diabetics also causes the pancreas to not secrete as much insulin as they did before. So they kind of become this type 1.5 diabetic where they don't make insulin, and they have insulin resistance, okay? Um, all right, so that's type 2 diabetes. Now, in order for you to actually get DKA, right, you have to have some sort of trick, right? Because type 1 diabetics use their insulin, they've been given a regimen, type 2 diabetics, they have their insulin production, or they take their antihypoglycemic, or they also take insulin. And so I think about the triggers as anything that causes catabolism, right? So we talk about insulin being an anabolic hormone, Anything that causes your body to increase consumption of energy. Right? And so I think about five things. Number one is infection. Number two is infarction. Insulin lack. Indiscretion, right? Which kind of the one that I think about the most is cocaine use, where it revs up your system and it causes increased consumption of, of energy. Uh, or pregnancy, right? So I think about the five eyes. Infection, infarction, insulin lack, indiscretion, and infant thumb. All right? So whenever I have a patient who comes in with DKA, I need to look for a trigger. These are the five things I think. By the way, if anybody has anything to add or any questions, please stop me at any time, okay? Especially Dr. Santavica over there. 
So what exactly is DK? Okay, and this is kind of simple, but there's a little bit of nuance to it. All right, so DK and A, right? So D stands for diabetic, and that's just basically the scale, right? So diabetes or DK is defined as you have to have a blood sugar of greater than 250. All right. Oh, it works. Okay, it's for keto. All right, so we talk about ketones being produced in the blood. <laughs> and can you guys read that? Is that too small? Is that okay? Sorry, I didn't realize it'd be that small. Uh, so ketones can either be measured in the blood or the urine, right? With a little caveat that if you're looking to measure in the urine, urine only measures one kind of ketone, acetoacetate, which is the least common one that you have, and especially in severe DKA patients, it's kind of even less common, all right? And number two, uh, DKA, when you have really high sugar, you get diuresis, and so you have a dilute urine, and you have uh, dilution of the ketones in the urine, and since the ketone measurement in urine is a qualitative one, right? You're looking for the change in color that you did, then it could be falsely negative. So just keep that in mind, right? Most of the time, urine is fine, but if you have somebody that you think has DKA and the urine is negative, maybe you need to measure it in the blood. And then finally, acidosis, right? And so this seems pretty simple. So it's a white gap and um, white anion gap metabolic acidosis, right? Which we all know the mod pile stuff. Uh, and it's defined as, in, in the textbook definition of DKA, by carb less than 18, pH less than 7.3, which when you look at your BBG, which is always a little more acidotic than your ABG, you kind of tolerate a little bit of 0.05 to 0.03 difference, uh, and then you need your high iron gap, okay? First point is, don't correct the sodium when you activate the high iron gap, okay? I've had two transfers from hospitals where they send a patient where they think they have a really high iron gap, you can say correct the sodium, okay? This is wrong. Right, because the actual body sodium is what is measured in the BMP. Right, you don't have to correct. So when you measure your gap, use the sodium that's actually reported in the BMP. Don't correct the okay? When I got the transfer, yes. they told me that they had a gap, and then when they came here and I looked at the labs, they had actually corrected for the glucose. Right? You can correct the sodium, but you have to correct the chloride with it. And if you do that, you can you get the same idea. Yeah. Either don't correct it or correct the sodium and the chloride. Yeah. So exactly. So it, it all it all evens out if you do one or the other. But if you just leave it alone and look at the at the measurement that's already in the blood, then that's your anion gap. Okay. Now this seems pretty simple, right? And so this is kind of a simple ED way of of thinking about acid. <laughs> right? Thank you. And so I'm glad to see you. So. I'm all, and I, and I, I'm all for simplicity. However, I don't want to replace simplicity for ignorance, all right? And in the same way that DK and HHS are our diseases, who sees the first BPG? Who sees the first ABG in the, in the patient comes in? Us, right? When critical care gets a the patient, they've already had two BPGs from the ED. They already know what's going on with the patient. So who sees the undifferentiated patient with an abnormal BPG or ABG? Us. So again, this is our disease. We should be experts at ABGs and BPGs. Which is why we have this wonderful gentleman here in the front who's going to talk to us about acid base in about an hour. Okay? And so there's a couple of caveats to that, right? You think about DK, it's pretty simple. It's just a wide anion gap metabolic acidosis. Let's take a look at this patient, okay? So I wish this was bigger. So I'll read out. So this is a 66 year old male. He has a history of CKD4, COPD, type 2 diabetes. He comes in lethargic. He's altered to the emergency room. He's in respiratory distress. He has a fever of 1 of 3.4. These are his labs, okay? So he's got sodium of 149, uh, potassium 5.1, his white carb is 9, uh, his BUN is 72, his glucose is 330, his ionine gap is 34, he's got a really high lactate, he's acidotic in his BBG, his PCO2 is quite high in his urea ketone okay? so Does he have DKA? Okay, so he's got the criteria for the white carb, he's got a high ionine gap, he's got an elevated glucose, right? And we have the ketones, we have the D, the K, and the A. But this picture's a little bit muddy, right? So this guy has both a white gap metabolic acidosis and a respiratory acidosis, right? This is PCO2 at time. He's got a low white carb, he's got a high PCO2. Right? So he's got a mixed picture. So he's got, now the question is, where is this white gap coming from, right? So he's got a high lactate, he's got a high glucose, he's got a high UN, he's got CO2 retention. Um, and so what's going on with this guy, right? Is he okay or not? And the answer is, I, you don't really know. You don't really know from these dummies, right? But the answer is, Assume he does, right? So treat him for it. And what I say is, so if he looks like somebody has DK, if somebody has a wide gap metabolic acidosis or hyperglycemia, they're a diabetic, there's really not that much harm in treating for DK, 
right? It's really just insulin and fluid. And as long as you do it right, which I'm going to try to teach you guys, then I think there's no harm in treatment. Okay. Now, this is another picture. This is a 22-year-old. She's got type 1 diabetes. And she's been vomiting like crazy since last night after she went on a bender. She was using cocaine. And she was drinking a lot of alcohol. She's coming in. She's weak. She's lightheaded. She's tachycardic. And she's hypotensive. <coughs> so... So you 144, her potassium is 4.9, <clears throat> okay, chloride is 91, her bicarbonate is a little bit low, but it's not crazy, it's 90. Uh, her renal function is maybe a little bit high, you know, she's a little bit dry. Her glucose is high, uh, her lactate is a touch high, uh, her pH is fine, she's got alcohol on her system. However, this a leader. oh yeah, uh, her anion gap is really high, and she's got ketones in the urine, right? So, this is patient of DKA. So, doesn't necessarily meet textbook criteria, right? So she's got basically normal pH. Her bicarb isn't that high. You have ketones, dehydration, and this is the kick, right? So, and I'm sure we're going to talk about this more during the lecture, but a high and ion gap should particular that, right? So even if there's a normal pH, this person has a mixed disorder, right? So she has a white gap metabolic acidosis, in addition to a metabolic alkalosis from all the vomiting that she's doing, right? So this patient is a ton sicker than it looks from her labs, right? So the patient looks fine. The bike trip looks fine. But this girl has really bad decay that is being compensated in a way by the significant amount of vomiting that she has. Well, I have this <laughs> And you're... Yeah, there we go. So I just... There you go. I cheated. Uh, so just, just watch for that, all right? Don't take the numbers at face value. Think about your patient. Don't treat the numbers too All right? So think about whenever the patient has a mixed disorder. This is a combination of different acidoses. This is an acidosis and alkalosis. Uh, and be careful. Be careful with just writing things off just because the numbers are broken. All right? If you have a high and ion gap, think about why it's high. Because it's <coughs> almost always an acidosis, 99.9% .9 of the time, uh, unless you have multiple myeloma. Um, but that's pretty much uh, it. Okay. So, again, DKA, diabetic, ketoacidosis. All right. So just kind of the signs and symptoms, symptoms that you'll see. So the patients are antibiotic, as we talked about. They're dehydrated from all the diuresis and possibly vomiting they have. Uh, and then kind of the two things that I want to talk to, touch about here is hyperkalemia. So uh, the patients are antibiotic, which shifts the potassium out of the cell. So you'll see hyperkalemia in their blood whenever they first come in. Uh, but keep in mind that they're, these patients are, are diuresis, right? So they've been peeing a lot for a while, and so they've been peeing a lot of potassium. So their total body potassium is actually low even though their blood potassium is actually uh, And one thing that we almost never think about when we talk about DK is the patient's phosphate, right? So the same way that you're pouring out potassium in the urine, you're also pouring out phosphate, okay? So this patient's total body phosphate is also low. So how do you treat DKA and keep it simple and fast? Okay? And this is kind of the, the meat and the most important part of the lecture, all right? So step one, look at stuff, all right? So these patients are dehydrated before you do anything else. When you get a patient that looks at DKA, Starts in fluid. Okay? And so, who here, whenever you get your patient, you just grab a bag of normal stuff? Everybody grabs a bag of normal stuff. Everybody grabs a bag of normal stuff. Does anybody know the content of normal saline? And I've talked to you a bunch of you guys about this already, right? So it's 49. It's 154, right? So if you look at normal saline compared to blood, normal saline actually has 154 milliequivalents of sodium and chlorine. Why? Because it has to be isosmolar and chlorine. Right? So you want to give something that has the same osmolarity as blood. And so they just put in a bunch of salt and water to make it as osmolar as blood. But they left everything else out. Okay? So if I took your blood and I replaced it with normal saline, so if I gave you 10 liters of normal saline immediately, that's what your sodium would be. Right? So what's the pH of normal saline? It's super low. It's 5.5. So if I take a patient who's already sick, who's already acidotic, and I slam it with five liters of normal saline, <coughs> what am I going to do with their pH? I'm going to make it worse. Right? So when I give somebody five, six liters of normal saline, whether they're septic, DKA, whatever it is I'm doing, I actually precipitate what's called a hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. Right? So it's a non-anion gap, hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis, which I'm sure you guys are going to learn about as well. It is that. It is that. Perfect. Uh, and so normal saline really should be called abnormal saline. It's not, it's not physiologic. Uh, so we have a bunch of these other fluids uh, which we can use, right? So LR is old school, but it's much closer to blood than, 
the normal selling. And then we have these newer ones, which are actually pretty much almost exactly your plasma, right? So they use different base to kind of buffer the fluid, but it's kind of the same idea. Your body will convert acetate to bicarbonate. Right? And so there's been some studies where they show that actually in DK, because the, the, the textbook teaching is you grab your bag of normal saline, you throw it in the patient, right? DK. The truth is, these balanced fluids actually a lot better for patients. This is a statement from ESA, um, where they have one counterfeit. They talk about that all our patients in our ED should be resuscitated with balanced fluid. Right? We still give normal saline to 95% of patients. And this should really change. It's cheaper. Normal saline? But it's actually not that much. So a bag of normal saline costs about 10 cents, a bag of plasma costs about 20 cents. So it's twice as much, but it's really not that much of a difference. Exactly. You're making them worse. And there's been some good studies in the ICU literature about these kind of fluids versus normal saline for septic patients. Not a lot of great studies for DKA is kind of the only one that I found. But the truth is that if you look at physiologically, it makes sense that you're replacing patients with the same stuff they're losing. Right? Uh, so this is what I do, okay, to keep it simple. And, and this is not sort of a standard protocol. This is what I do, okay, just to remember. So I give two liters in the first hour, plasma life or normal, whatever you have. And then I give about 500 after that to aim for about five liters and five hours. Okay? And I know that doesn't add up to full five if I do this, but I just try to remember easy numbers, right? So two liters first hour, and then five over five. All right, step two, potassium. So like we talked about, these patients are, their total body potassium is low, right? Which is different than their serum potassium, which is high. Does that make sense? Right? So they've been feeding a lot of potassium, but they're acidotic. They're also sick, which means they're having some cell death, which means they're leaking potassium out into the, into the serum. So they're, their serum potassium is high, their total body potassium is low. So it's really tricky to handle these patients potassium, right? Because once you start giving them fluids, you're diluting that potassium, which is already low in their system. Uh, and once you start giving them insulin, you're pushing insulin, or you're pushing potassium into the cells. And so this balance of potassium is really, really big. And so DKA patients die from a couple of things. They die from the underlying trigger, right? So their heart attack, their sepsis, whatever it is. They also die from hyperkalemia and hypokalemia, right? They come in hyperkalemic, they die. Or you make them hypokalemic, and they die. Okay, so this is where you really, really, really have to be an expert and be really careful when you're taking care. So this is what I do. When the patient comes in, I assume they're hyperkalemic, all right, because most of them are going to be. And I get an EKG immediately, and I look at the EKG. If the EKG looks like hyperkalemia, I treat, right? Calcium chloride, which I've also beat to death with you guys. I don't use calcium glucanate. Calcium chloride is the right calcium to use for DKA. Insulin. Bolus, bicarb, albuterol, right? Whatever you need to do to bring that 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 uh, potassium down initially. Right? Is the DKA or the glucose is not going to kill you at that moment. The so what's going to kill you is a hyperkalemia. So treat the hyperkalemia, and then you can figure out. The and now, if it's not crazy hyperkalemic, then during our therapy, we have to watch for hypokalemia. Right? Because like we talked about, once we start giving insulin, we're dropping potassium into the cell, we use hypokalemia. So what I do is, your potassium is high, so greater than five. Leave it alone. If your potassium is normal, 3.55. Then I add potassium to my fluids, about 20 milli equivalents uh, now. And if it's low, then I stop the insulin, and I add 40 milli equivalents now. Again, this is not a standard protocol. There's people who do this differently. This is just an easy way for me to remember, so I don't have to remember specific numbers. Right? Some people say 5.3, you add potassium. Some people say you add 10, and then 20, and then 30, and then 40. I find that really hard. So I found this does well enough for me, and if anybody has any other protocols that you think are better, please speak up. Uh, <clears throat> and then this is another uh, sort of point for using balance fluids, right? So normal saline has no potassium, right? So if you start slamming these people with lots and lots and lots of normal saline, you're going to dilute their potassium. Right? If you give them the balance fluids, you can, you're actually giving them back something with normal potassium. And so you actually can prevent, or you don't induce hypokalemia as badly with uh, balanced fluids as you do with normal time. Uh, so use balanced fluids. And now, kind of talk about this for a second. Yes, sir. Uh, so 
Um, so, phosphorus. So I only really think about this in critical patients, right? Patients who are super dry, patients who are really asymptotic, patients who you're going to have to give insulin to and you're going to have to monitor the closely because they're going to be hypophosphatemic. And uh, I know we rarely talk about phosphate, but phosphate is one of the things that when it becomes really low, it can be a problem, right? Because phosphate is the main substrate for ATP. And so when you don't have enough phosphate in your system, you don't have enough energy, which means you get like depression, which means you get cerebral depression, right? So Get coma, these people can get uh, heart attack, these people will get decreased energy everywhere in their system, and you can make it worse by giving them insulin, right? So, in really sick TK patients, think about phosphate in addition to everything, right? So, what I do again is uh, if my phosphate is abnormal, so below 1.5, I add 0 0.5 mLs per hour, right? So, I try to keep it in fives. So you get five liters in five hours of fluid. If your phosphate's low, add 0.5 mLs per hour, okay? So, we talked about fluids, we talked about potassium, we talked about when you give it this low, it's actually not that much of a problem. But, but you're right. It, it should you should think about it uh, when you're adding the test. Uh, and then finally, or not finally, step four is insulin. Uh, and I want to make quick five points about this. Okay, so number one is short acting IV insulin, so regular insulin is the insulin. Why is regular insulin the insulin of choice? Uh, I try to look for it, and there's really no reason why this is not used. It's probably because it's the original one, probably because it's the first one, probably which everybody used to use when they started treating the okay? So why don't we use long acting? That makes sense, right? Because long acting, it's harder to titrate, it's harder to know what your sugars are going to be when you give something that's going to stand last there for a long time. But why don't we give Lisper or Raspard, right? The rapid acting. Really, I don't know. I don't know. And I tried to look for, for studies that compared one to the other in the IV form. There wasn't anything. So it was just a standard of care. Regular is. I don't know if you have anything else to add. Everybody else has an added yeah. Everybody has what everybody's been doing. Okay? So regular is what we use. Somebody asked me this the other day, so I was curious. I don't know. Uh, now, insulin bolts. Can we give an insulin bolts? Say yes. Say no. Uh, the study in the Journal of Emergency Medicine, it was a prospective cohort study. We took about 150 patients. Uh, where half of them gave an insulin bolus, half of them did not. Okay. So this is what they found. That there were no differences in glucose or anion gap change. All right. And there was actually a trend, which wasn't statistically significant, towards increased hypoglycemia in patients with who had an insulin bolus. Okay. And then, kind of thinking about it physiologically, there's a couple of other things that I get concerned when I give an insulin bolus. Number one is, if you remember, uh, sort of the role of insulin, uh, kind of the one that I want to talk about is insulin causes glucose to be taken up into the cell, right? And glucose is an osmotic molecule. And so what happens is insulin pushes glucose into the cell, your glucose goes up in, in, your, in your cell and it goes down in the blood. If you give somebody a bolus, you're going to increase the rate of this, right? So you're going to massively, you're going to switch, you're going to shift their glucose quickly from the extracellular space into the intracellular space. And what flows along with glucose? Fluid. So you get really intravascular fluid. So somebody who's already really dry, because they've been peeing a lot because they're sick, and you give them a swig of insulin, which pushes fluid into the cell, you're going to make them even more intravascularly depleted, which can lead to ischemia, can lead to infarcts, can lead to okay. uh, And so um, I don't give insulin bolts, all right? Unless the patient is hyperkinetic, right? That is the one time the hyperkinetic is going to kill them initially, if they're not hyperkalemic, then I just started. So I don't give it an EKG shape, right? So somebody who has an EKG where they have PT waves or they have theoretical elongation or heart block or any kind of induction. I'm treating hyperkalemia, exactly. Right. So Q insulin. So we've heard a little bit about this recently. Um, is it okay to choose a Q insulin? So these are really small studies. There hasn't been anything really big. 
but they looked at, this is the only RCT that actually we're going to talk about today, because there hasn't been that many for DK. Uh, and they compared IV regular insulin to sub q which is one of the rapid active insulins. This is a little protocol, kind of similar to what we use for IV insulin, but they have their own thing. Uh, and they really found a difference now. So for mild or moderate DK, sub-Q and IV insulin seem okay. This is a Cochrane review where they took a look at all the studies they've done for sub-Q versus IV insulin. And this is what they found. So they provided mainly data in adults, mostly low to very low quality evidence. So that already kind of tells you what kind of stuff they're looking at. But they said there really doesn't seem to be a difference between using sub-Q or IV insulin in mild to moderate DK. Okay. So consider it, right? I rarely use it. I don't have a lot of experience using it. I still kind of use the bolus. But if you have somebody with mild to moderate DK, you probably use sub-Q insulin. So. You gotta get by in your hospitals. Yeah, I don't know. I was gonna say, Nick, do you do you use it? So in that seat, did that? Uh, okay, and then a couple of other points that I want to make that are, these are more my points and studies. Is, there's been a couple of case reports of patients who have severe insulin resistance, whether it's genetic or whether it's super advanced type of diabetes. And these patients require huge doses of insulin to correct the gap. Right? So when I'm talking about huge doses, I'm talking about two to five units per kilogram. Right? For DK, kind of the standard dose is 0.1 units per kilogram. Right? So like 20 to 50 times as much insulin as you give in normal DK. Uh, and it took a lot to get them off this grid to fix their gap. So the question for me is, is there a little bit of a trend towards increased requirements of insulin in patients who have insulin resistance, aka type 2 diabetics, right? So type 1 diabetics, they don't have insulin resistance, so as long as you give them enough insulin, they're going to stop ketone body production. Type 2 diabetics, maybe they need more insulin than type 2, all right? So I wonder in, in these patients, the late stage type 2 diabetics, should we be giving them higher doses than the type 1? I do. So um, that's kind of the point there. Okay. And then last but not least, back to our little diagram. You guys remember, insulin inhibits the production of ketone bodies. The opposite of insulin is glucagon, right? So glucagon is a catabolic hormone, and it actually induces the production of ketone bodies, right? So glucagon is secreted when your sugar is low, your body needs more energy, and so what it does is it says, oh my god, I need something to consume. So I break down my fat. And then I can turn that fat into ketone. Whenever your body has no energy, this way. <clears throat> okay. Usually, when you have a lot of glucose, you inhibit that process. When you have a little amount of glucose, then that process is revved up. So, what happens when you treat these patients with DKA and you make them hypoglycemic? You're going to induce this. Okay. So, hypoglycemic DKA patients, you're giving a lot of insulin to. If you don't watch their sugar, you're going to give them a redox. Okay. So, the number five point is watch for hypoglycemia. Okay. So, quickly, this is what I do. If I see EKG changes with hyperkalemia, I give them a 10-unit bolus of regular insulin. Okay. If I don't see that, then I do. <clears throat> Consider sub insulin for mild DKA. I rarely do this. But think about it. And if not, is your insulin drip? I'm sort of giving my thoughts about insulin resistance. I'll start my type 1 DKA at 5 units per hour. My type 2 is at 8. Again, a lot of people do things differently. This is just for me to remember numbers easily. Okay, so 5 and 8. And then I follow my glucose system. Okay? Once it drops below 250, then I don't want to induce hypoglycemia. <clears throat> so I do one of two things. If the patient's still really acidotic, really ketotic, then I don't want to drop the insulin drip, right? Because they still need the insulin to stop ketone body damage. But my sugar's getting low. So then what I do is I replete my sugar. So what I start doing is I split my fluids. So I switch to about half of my balanced fluid and half of a sugar fluid. This is tough to do in our hospitals because our nursing staff is so stressed. But if you have you know, time and you're able to do it, this is sort of what I do. Right. And then if the patient is getting better, the ketoacidosis improved, then I drop down the insulin drip to about one an hour. And I give them a long acting dose, or a dose of their long acting insulin that they take. So once again, bolus of hyperkalemic, start your drip, five and eight, watch for hypoglycemia. <clears throat> okay? And if your blood sugar ever drops below 100, 
don't want to induce further hypoglycemia, then I stop the insulin drip and I give them an active okay. I'd rather they be in their sugar 200, 250 than, because uh, right? the problem is not the sugar at this point, the problem is the keto acid. Right? I'm sorry? You mean like type 2 diabetics who don't take insulin or? Or like new type 1 diabetics? In what sense? How do I feel about this? I mean, I would treat them the same, right? So I start at 5. Uh, if, the, if I don't think they have severe insulin resistance, right? So if these patients are insulin naive, I would treat them like type 1 diabetics. And just start at 5 and then watch the nutrition. Yeah. The that's tough, right? Because it, when somebody's in renal failure, then they're not going to excrete the insulin. Um, and so at that point, you really just have to watch your sugar relief. Uh, and if they get really low, then you stop the insulin and repeat. Um, but I think the most important part is treating the, the ketoacidosis, and then you just monitor the really close. I don't know if you have a different uh, I give a lower dose. If they're insulin, and they have renal failure, you start at two or three? Four. I had some insulin from a neurologist a couple days ago. I don't know if you had a diagnosis of patient and see if you're on the disease. There is Develop the unconic diuresis because they're in Europe. So actually, the data is extremely rare. They're on diagnosis. But if they do make their end, they just have to be consistent. That's fair. And the last question is should we get bifurcated? Okay. Um, and the study done, these are pretty old. This is from 1986. <laughs> Most of you guys in this room weren't born. Uh, <clears throat> but this is a prospective study. Uh, and they had 24 patients, and half of them got bicarb, half of them didn't. What were the outcomes? There really was no difference in the rate of decrease of, and they actually checked the CSF in these patients, which I thought was really hardcore. Uh, I guess they were trying to see whether there would be a difference in the CSF versus the plasma. They didn't find it. I think they had IRB approval on that. Right. Uh, another study, also pretty old. Retrospective, really small. Again, kind of the other point I wanted to make is this is the pH ranges they were using, so pretty severe, but not crazy severe. Uh, and same for this one. Again, half got bicarb, get really no difference. And they showed that if the patient got bicarb, there was some increase in hypokalemia, right? which makes sense. Right? Bicarb pushes the test into this. So what, I, what do I do? I get bicarb only if the patient has EKG changes of hyperkaling it. Or if they are really, 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 really severely acidotic and they have some sort of ultimate status of right? Do I have evidence for that? No. Uh, is there expert recommendations? Somewhat. Experts usually say that if they're super acidotic, consider bicarb. This is just what I do, right? Because at that point, the acidosis of 6.6 .6 is going to kill them before I get them treated. Okay. Um, so, really quick summary fluids. Two liters in the first hour, five liters over five hours. Potassium. If they are hyperkalemic, treat immediately. Otherwise, monitor while you're treating and add potassium if it gets normal or low. Okay. Phosphate. Check in your really critical cases. If it's low, replete. Because otherwise, you can use hypophosphate. Insulin. Uh, consider sub-Q. Otherwise, start your bolus. Five or eight if they're renal patients, half your dose, whatever you use. Uh, and then once the sugar starts getting lower, if they're getting better, decrease their insulin drip. If they're not getting better, add sugar. And if they get really hypoglycemic, stop the insulin and give them some sugar. Uh, and then consider bicarb for super, super severely acidotic patients. Um, what time is it? Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, of course. For the DK, I've been doing this for 33 years. I probably invaded by DK. It doesn't happen very often. This is the home run of emergency medicine. People are sick as crap, and then two hours later, they will break. So you have to own this. But you have to intubate one of these people, think very, very carefully about it, and three problems. I don't know where the Jacoby monocure on the scale of rock versus sucks for RSI, but if you suspect EKA and you don't have prompt labs, this is not the person you want to give sucks to if you would rather think of the doctor. This is a rock your own patient. If you have to innovate these people, that's number one. Number two, except for the renal failure one, these people are dry. So you have to intubate them. These are the people you consider resuscitating before intubating with fluids. Use your ultrasound, look at their IVC. They're already intravascularly down. 
they have catacolds pounding away, and you take away the catacolds of the RSI, you're going to have a post-intubation cardiac arrest hypotension 100% of the time. And three, we're going to talk about this in the next hour, these people have a profound metabolic acidosis. They have a profound respiratory compensation. So their CO2s are in the 20, 15 to 25 range. When you intubate them, you use standard ARDS long settings, respiratory of 16, you're not going to, you're taking away their respiratory compensation for the metabolic acidosis. Your pH is going to plummet post intubation. So you can have a peri intubation cardiac arrest 100% of the time. You don't keep those three things in mind. Thank you. I'll stop there. Because I know that my time is up. Uh, but uh, any questions? Uh, when you're given bicarb, are you especially very well? Right, so I just do a push right down there. It's all about stabilizing them while you get them better. Right? So the point of bicarb is not to kind of keep them sort of progressively alkalotic. It's to fix that pH for 15 minutes while you start your cylinder of your fluids, right? Or fix that hyperkalemia for 15 minutes while you also start your cylinder of your fluids. It's just an easy, quick bike card that you grab from the crash card that this patient has a pH of 6.7 or a pH of 7. So, yeah. So, this is in my ideal world. Somebody's super, I'm doing two one hour sugars. They're super sick. DVDs and BMPs 2 2. I don't really say Q4, and they're really, really mild, and maybe you can stretch that. Correct, that's why. Uh, not here, right? Not any. <laughs> not any. Uh, 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 That's a fair point. You know? Yeah. If you if your sugar is happening every four hours and your sugar is 275, then you've got to be rid of it. So you either go and check in 30 minutes to get to speed it slow, or you just start to the glue side. I don't know. I don't know how long it'll take. Uh, it's just about preventing them becoming more hypoplastic. Right? So uh, usually patients will become symptomatic at about one. Right. So our, our lab report's low at 1.5. Patients will start having symptoms at one. At 0 0.5, they get really, really nervous. Right? So if you sort of maintain a constant infusion, you'll prevent them from getting that low. Do I know how that's happens? Okay. Okay. So I think if, if the patient is not vomiting and they're looking okay, that's fine, right? Because the problem is not, again, the problem is not the hyperglycemia. I caused the diuresis, but while you're there, you're giving them fluids, right? So the problem really is the ketoacidosis. So if they eat, as long as their gut's working, as long as they're not vomiting, as long as they're not super vascular depleted, they're having an ileus, then it's okay for them to eat, right? Obviously, if they're really sick, if they're abundant, no, but if they're looking better, I have no problem with them. Is there any difference in the so, yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I say it in adults, yeah, yeah, I do well after three minutes, <laughs> yeah. Pete, in a nutshell, go slower to get your blue team on. Yeah. No bowl is definitely lighter on the fluid, slow, slow, slow. The kid, for whatever reason, gets three blue team on. So whatever you do in adults, dial it down. So, real quick, how much calcium is there in calcium book in a you know, three times. So there's as, three times as much calcium in calcium chloride as in calcium glucose, right? The glucose molecule is really big. The chloride molecule is really small. So when you get uh, one gram of calcium glucose, you're getting a third of the calcium you're giving calcium chloride. 
And it takes a little bit of a while to push 3 amps of calcium glucose, right? So by the time you finish pushing that third amp, that first amp is already starting to get cleared by your kidney, right? So if you have somebody who actually has real hyperkalemia at that moment, you push an amp of calcium chloride immediately, right? Because that person is going to die in the next 5 to 10 minutes. By the time you push that calcium gluconate, your patient has a calcium. Right? Um, there's this whole thing about, like, oh, we're a little bit high, so let's just push the calcium gluconate just in case, but it really doesn't do very much. Right? So when you're pushing it just in case, how long does it last in your system? Your, your kidney's going to be at that. Right? So calcium lasts in your system 20, 30 minutes. Right? And so by the time uh, you start, so let's say you have a, a patient who's normally giving you with a high potassium, you give them calcium gluconate. It's not going to do very much. Right? If you let the potassium stay high, 45 minutes later, that calcium is not in their system anymore. You have to reduce the calcium and calcium chloride. Right? So really the calcium for hyperkalemia is calcium chloride acutely when there's EKG changes of depolarization. Right, so PRS prolongation, heart blocks, uh, or any kind of uh, bundle branch block you're seeing that's new, then I push calcium glucose. Doesn't matter, wherever it is, right? I don't care. At that point, I don't care if I necrose their vein or whatever it is. What's going to kill them is the potassium, right? Uh, but if they just have peak T waves or they have the EKG changes, then calcium is not indicated, right? Because what calcium does is it stabilizes depolarization, and it's when you have abnormality of depolarization that you need to care. The PT wave is not deployed. Uh, with a caveat that at a place like our hospital where it's tough to get a repeat EKG, where it's tough to get repeat labs, where maybe the labs weren't drawn, if you are starting to see changes of hyperkalemia in an EKG, then maybe it's okay to push the calcium even with just PT waves because you don't know where that's going, right? In an ideal world, again, where you can get a potassium on a, a rapid stick, right? So a lot of hospitals now where you can just get a point of care BBG, or you can get a repeat EKG in 10, 15, 20 minutes, then you can wait, right? But when your resources are less, and then you consider giving care, which is what I think, which is why we do what we do. Thanks, guys. <laughs>